in a bit. Okay, recording is on. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today, class on Wednesday. We have uh, two lectures on uh, our journey through Romans. Uh, time to just study the scriptures, um, verse by verse, and uh, see what uh, the Lord has revealed here. Let's take a moment just to pray, and we'll get started. Just want to invite somebody, please uh, pray with us as a class, and we will get started. Anyone can unmute your mic and please pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy over us. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We submit the rest of the, the this today's lecture into your hands. Jesus, even as we learn from your word, help us understand. Holy Spirit, Reveal your, your, your word beautifully to us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, thank you. All right, so we're in Romans chapter 2. We are uh, journeying through the book of Romans, chapter by chapter, uh, reading it verse by verse and drawing um, truth uh, out of that. So just a quick review, uh, Romans chapter 2. Uh, what we have seen uh, earlier is that uh, you know Paul is writing to the believers uh, in Rome, and by this time, uh, the congregation or, or what's the congregation or the church in Rome is made up of believers, both who are both Jews and Gentiles. So initially, of course, it was started by uh, you know there were many predominantly Jewish believers because they were the ones who were impacted um, in, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They headed back to Rome. But then, you know, over time, uh, we have uh, Gentile believers as well. And by, by the time Paul is writing, it is very likely that the leadership of the, of the, church, of the, of the church in Rome, uh, many leaders would have been Gentile believers. But you also have Jewish believers. So in chapter 2, uh, you know, so Paul, of course, this, this epistle is written to the church in Rome, meaning it's to both Jews and Gentiles. But in chapter two, he's really addressing Jewish believers, meaning believers who've come from uh, the strong background of the law of the circumcision, and now they are they have embraced Christ. Um, how do you speak to them? How do you explain things to them? Right, and so in the initial starting of chapter two. Uh, he is really uh, Paul. Uh, so, if I if I want to summarize chapter two, and we are going to read through chapter two, uh, read through it verse by verse. But if if you look uh, at chapter two, Paul is almost like you know he's he's very logically addressing these Jewish believers, and he's saying, okay, you have the law, but if you don't keep the law. It's of no use. So these people were, you know, taking so much pride. We have the law, we have the co covenants or circumcision, which is a sign of the covenant. We have, we are people of the law. We have people, you know, who have circumcision as a sign of the covenant with God. But Paul needs to drive home to them that uh, if you're a teacher of the law, but you don't keep the law, it's pointless. You know, you can be excited that you have the law. And that you can teach the law. This is what is the right thing to do, and this is what uh, uh, I must avoid. But if you don't keep the law, then it is pointless. Then, because God is going to judge us according to you know, and He tells us how uh, the judgment of God is. You know, that's another theme we see in chapter two: the judgment of good God is going to judge us and he, he highlights that As, and then he also uh, says look the Gentiles they don't have the law they don't have the written law but God has given them a conscience which is the law of God in their hearts so for them there is something inside them telling them what is right is what is wrong conscience but then he, Paul is very clear, and we will see in this chapter um, that 
eventually everyone, whether Jew or Gentile, they'll be judged by God according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we will see that he points, he's very clear about that. And then towards the closing part of this chapter, he addresses the issue of circumcision. So he says, you know, uh, the Jews, you know, initially uh, he addressed the issue of the law. You have the law, wonderful, but if you don't keep the law, it's no use. The Gentiles, they have the conscience, which is God's law in their heart. And eventually everybody is going to be judged by the gospel. And then he says, okay, circumcision, that's another thing that makes the Jews very proud. Like we have circumcision, the sign of circumcision. And then Paul says, look, uh, there is something more important than this physical circumcision. What God really is interested is in the circumcision of the heart. That means a real Jew is somebody whose heart has been circumcised towards God. Right? So, and then, you know, so basically in chapter two, he's trying to tell them, look, neither Jew, uh, both Jew and Gentile are falling short, are, are sinners before God, which he gets into chapter three, are sinners before God and fall short of God's righteous standards. So that's what he's building up to. But, you know, it's very interesting to see how he develops uh, the thought, right? So we had, we had covered uh, the initial part of chapter two. Uh, we will just quickly um, uh, maybe read verses one through 11, just to refresh our memory, just read uh, Romans chapter two, one through 11, and then we will uh, kind of go forward uh, uh, from there. Romans two. 1 through 11. Somebody could just read it. This is just to refresh our memory. Uh, Romans 2, 1 through 11. Therefore you are incusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge, for in whatever you judge another you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same thing. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth, against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you, have, uh, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But the accordance with the hand, with the hardness and your impen, impenitent heart, you are pleasing up for yourself what in the day of wrath uh, and revelation of the righteous, righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory honor and immorality Immo but to those who are immortality yeah but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and what tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the jew first and also of the greek but glory honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God, for mm. as many as have okay, sinned we'll with stop. the... Till verse 11, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, uh, just to quickly review, what Paul has explained here is, if you, are having the law, you're judging others, you know, so you know what is right and wrong. You can teach others what is right and wrong. And you can also judge others. You, you can condemn what is wrong because you know, you don't know, you know what's right, what's wrong. So if somebody does something wrong, you can point it out, you can condemn. But he says, if you are doing that, but you yourself are not practicing the same things, then don't think you can escape the judgment of God. 
So he's, he's really talking directly to the Jews. Don't think you can escape the judgment of God. And you must also understand verse 4. We highlighted this last week. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. Right? So we must keep that in mind, you know, as we work with people. Of course, we know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, we, those of us who know the word of God, uh, we know what's right and what's wrong. And uh, we can quick, be quick to point out what is wrong. But don't forget that the goodness of God leads people to repentance. And that doesn't mean we condone sin. That's not it. But we be gracious to people. Right? We love them because it's God's goodness that leads them to repentance. And then he says there verses 5 through 11, you know, regardless of whether you're Jew or Gentile, God is a righteous God. His judgment is righteous. You know, um, that's verse 5, end of verse 5. The righteous judgment of God. God is a righteous judge, an impartial judge. And he's going to judge everybody according to their deeds. That's verse 6, you know, according to what you do. He's also going to judge us uh, according to what we are seeking. You know, so are you seeking for glory, honor, immortality? You know, what, what are you seeking? Right? And, uh, and so he says, those who are doing what's right and who are seeking the truth, they will be judged righteously and, and uh, they will end. And uh, those who are doing wrong, they will also be judged. And uh, twice in verse 9 and verse 10, he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The reason he says to the Jew first is because the Jews were given the law. Right? So they have it first. But the Greeks, the Gentiles, when he says Greeks, we mentioned last week, he's referring to the Gentiles. They will also be judged. And then from verse 12 through verse 16, he's talking about how everybody's going to be judged. So he says, you know, there is this, the law, of course. The Jews have the law, verse 12. Uh, those, the Gentiles are without the law. But the Gentiles, by nature, do the things that are uh, accepted by the law. How, how do they do that? Verse 15. The law is written in their hearts. The conscience is telling them what's right and wrong. Okay. So we said the conscience, and we closed with this last week. The conscience is an alternate for the law of God. So they may not have the commandments, the Ten Commandments. They may not have it written down for them. But in their hearts, they know. It's not good to steal. It's not good to kill, commit murder. It's not good to commit adultery. Uh, it's not good to covet what is not yours. They know. How do they know? It's the conscience. It's the law that's written inside them. But then he concludes in verse 16. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So notice how he, he concludes. God is going to judge the secrets of man. I mean, everything, everything's going to be judged. He's going to judge it according to my gospel. That means the judgment of God, which is a righteous judgment, which is an impartial judgment, which is judgment according to the truth, will be done according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not according to the law, not according to conscience, but according to the gospel. Now, I want to emphasize that because, you know, a, a big question many, many people have is, uh, what happens to those who do not hear the gospel? What happens, you know, how will God judge them? How will God judge them? So what we have, what Paul has explained to us so far in chapter 1 and chapter 2 is that 
there are people who have the law, so you know, they know what's right and what's wrong. And then there are people who don't have the law, but every person has two things. Every person has a reason, which we saw in chapter one. In chapter one, he said, nobody's without excuse because God has given evidence through his creation. And so people can reason, they can look at it and say, there is a creator. Because look at his creation, the invisible attributes of God are revealed in his creation. And then secondly, he's telling us, every person, Jew or Gentile, has a conscience. The Jews have the written law, but the Gentiles have a conscience. So there are two things inside every person, reason and conscience, that are directing us, that are convicting us, telling us that, there is a God, I need to seek after this true God. And every person who seeks after the true living God, God is going to, you know, in, in some way, bring uh, the gospel to that person. But if somebody completely, you know, dies, lives their entire life, complete life, and they never hear the gospel, what will happen to them? True, they have a conscience. True, they have reason. And maybe they reason and their conscience said, there is a living God, you have to seek for him. Uh, but they never hear about Jesus Christ and uh, they die. What about them? Well, we can, meant, we can state these two things. One, we know according to verse 16, everybody is going to be judged according to the gospel. So there is no excuse for the Jew or Gentile Everybody's going to be judged according to the gospel. That's one thing we know, and we cannot change that. Um, does God have, will God have another way to judge people who have never heard, never heard the gospel? Does God have another way to do it? Not as far as the scriptures tell us. So what I want to put forward to us is that we shouldn't uh, come up with some alternate options because the scriptures don't present that the scriptures just say look god will judge the secrets of men by jesus christ i'm looking at verse 16 according to the gospel that's all we know there is no alternate option available so from romans to keep this in mind so far there is law, there is conscience, there is gospel. The conscience is an alternate to the law, telling people what's right and wrong. The reason and conscience serve to convict people and direct them to seeking God. But everybody will be judged according to the gospel. As far as we know, there's no other option. What I want to um, request that we do not do is we should not and come to the conclusion that the conscience is an alternate to the gospel. Because sometimes you might hear some people say that. You know, they'll say, well, uh, for those who've never heard the gospel, uh, Paul has said here that um, the conscience is bearing witness um, and uh, it's it's the law of God in their heart. So uh, maybe God will judge them according to their conscience. Now, that is a wrong conclusion, I feel, because he is clearly telling us here in verse 16 that people will be judged according to the gospel. And what is the gospel? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And without Christ, there is no salvation. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we can be saved. So we should not conclude that uh, the conscience, that God would use the conscience as a replacement for the gospel, for those who have not heard the gospel. And that, that's a wrong conclusion. Uh, we just stay and abide by the gospel. Is God's standard for everybody? And that's why we need to proclaim the gospel. We need to uh, share the gospel, let people know about the gospel. Okay, 
so that brings us to end of verse 16, kind of where we stopped uh, last class. Um, any questions so far on, on what we have just, you know, just gone through so far? Any questions? Okay. All right. There are no questions. So we pick up in verse 17, um, Romans chapter 2, verse 17. And let's read through verse 24. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through to verse 24. Could somebody read that for us, please? Shall I read? Um, shall we give somebody another chance, someone else a chance, Manu? Romans mm -hmm. 2, 17 to 24. Thomas? Celery? Go ahead. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, Be behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident thou that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore, which teachest another teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery. Thou that horest idols, dost thou commit Scarless, scarless, thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, through you as it is written. Mm. So, this is a strong rebuke to the Jews. He's saying, you know, Jews, we know you are resting on the law. This is verse 17. I'm looking at verse 17. You are, you know, resting in the law. You rely on the law and you're boasting in God. And so the Jews said, hey, we got the law. We have it all written down for us here. Uh, this is what we are, you know, counting on. And, um, and we are boasting in God. And... Uh, we know verse 18, we know his will. We can tell you what is what is right, what is wrong. And we have all been taught by the law. Very good. But he says, look, how come you're all doing the same thing? Right? You are telling people don't steal, you're stealing. You're, you know, and he goes through this, those things. You, see, you, you, you yourself are doing the things that you have learned from the law, which you're not supposed to do. You're telling others, don't do it, but you yourself are doing it. So really it's, it's lead, you know, Paul is building up the case here to tell the Jews that Jews, it is true that you have the law. It is true that you know the law, you have been instructed of the law, you know what is approved by God, all of it is true but you're also breaking the law. So he's building that case. And, uh, and, and he's actually also even quoting from the Old Testament prophet, that's verse 24, he's saying, the name of God is blasphemed because you're, not, you know, you're doing exactly opposite of what the law says and what you're even teaching others, being exactly the opposite. And then verse 25 to 29, like we said earlier, he not only 
addresses the issue of the law, but he now goes into the issue of circumcision because that's another thing the, the Jewish people are very proud of, right? Uh, which is a sign of the covenant with God. So he addresses that, okay? So let's read verse 25 to 29. We'll look at that. Uh, could, uh, yeah. But Thomas, you want to read that now? Yeah, Anpa. For circumcision is indeed profitable. If we keep the but if you are breaker of the law, your circumcision will become unsufficient. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous of the law, will not his uncircumcision be as a circumcision, and will not the physical uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, even with your written code and circumcision, transgressor of the law, for he is not a Jew who is one outward outwardly. Now he is a circumcision, that is which God in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the script, in the spirit, that uh, whose praise is not from man but from God. Hmm. So now he is addressing another part, which thank you, Thomas. He's addressing another part that Jews are very, you know, proud of. He says, "Look, uh, the Jews, they say, verse twenty-five. You know, we are uh, we are circumcised, and um, uh, you know that's another you know another big thing. And of course, circumcision is a sign of the of the covenant with God, which they have physically. And he says, "Look." Even if you have circumcision, but you're breaking the law, you're not, you're not doing the right things, then the circumcision, which is a physical sign of your covenant with God, amounts to nothing. Because he says, look, the uncircumcised, that is the Gentile, if the uncircumcised keeps the law or does the things that is right, then shouldn't we say that, look, um, his uncircumcision is as good as him being circumcised because he is keeping the law. He is doing what's right before God. Right? So then he says, verse 28, 29, you know, what really matters is not the circumcision of the flesh. What really matters is not um, the physical circumcision, but really he's saying, the uh, circumcision of the heart. Now, that circumcision of the heart is talking about, you know, a change of heart. God takes out the, the heart of stone and he puts in the heart of flesh. So they understand that it, have, it has to deal with uh, an inward change. So he says, that is what is really important. Not the physical circumcision of the flesh okay and so he's really building this up now so you can imagine a, a, a jew saying look i have no options one i'm not able to keep the law and so just having the law or having circumcision doesn't amount to anything because i have failed before god and i i don't meet up to the righteous judgment of god so through chapter two, he has come built up so far, and he's going to continue on in chapter three. Now, uh, I just want to highlight, you know, uh, in the core, in the lecture notes, we have uh, uh, we have a couple of things that we've uh, highlighted, and I'll just quickly go through it. It's slightly different from how I have presented it. Um, yeah, yeah, so. Um, in, in the lecture notes, uh, so let me just share my screen. So we just look at that because um, there are some smaller side studies that, uh, that are there useful to look at. So let's just uh, do that. All right. So I'm just sharing my lecture notes with us. Um, all right. So chapter two. Uh, so what we say is Paul's really challenging the attitudes of Jews towards Gentiles. Right? So uh, we have mentioned this. 
and uh, we've summarized, you know, what are his main arguments? He says, you know, if you're judging others, you've got to hold yourself to the same standards. Uh, if you judge others and you practice the wrong, then you cannot escape God's judgment. Uh, it's God's goodness that uh, leads us to repentance. Uh, God's judgment is without partiality to the Jew first and to the Greek. Uh, um, those who have the law, God will judge according to the law. Those, uh, God has his own way to judge those outside the law. And, uh, you know, and Paul says, look, you have the written law, but this is of no use if you break the law and you don't keep the law. Now, here are some other summaries that I've done from this chapter, which may be of interest. Uh, Paul presents an understanding of God's judgment in this chapter. So we can see, you know, how does God judge? And if you will look, up, look through the chapter, you'll find this. First, he's going to, God judges according to truth. Yeah, that's Romans 2, 2. Then he judges righteous judgment. Romans 2, 5. And then in Romans 2, 11, we see he judges without partiality. In Romans 2, 16, he said he judges according to the gospel. So as far as God's judgment, this is how God will judge according to truth, which is the word of God, righteous judgment without partiality and according to the gospel. Uh, what does God judge? What are the things that God looks at when he is judging people? Again, you can see an interesting thing in Romans uh, chapter two. Uh, he says God will judge us for our deeds, what we do. He will judge us for our desires, what we seek after. And he also judges according to what drives us, that is our motives. So our deeds, our desires, and our drives, what motivates us, these, these three things. So God is going to judge that. So it's not just the deeds, but also the desires and the motivations, the drives, or uh, the uh, things that uh, inspire us, you know, what, what the in, in the part of us, which many times we don't look at, right? And Paul, you know, uh, he, for example, in First Corinthians 4 and verse 5, he once again says you know, that when the Lord comes, he will reveal the counsel of the hearts. The counsel meaning the motives, the purposes of the heart. And God will judge us uh, based on that, what God judges. And when will he judge, you know, twice, you know, um, Paul uh, in Romans 2, he indicates that there's going to be a day of wrath or, uh, or the day when God will judge. So there is an appointed day. And uh, of course, we see this in other places. Acts 17, verse 31, he has appointed a day uh, on which he will judge the world. So just a little study on the judgment of God. You know, how will God will judge? What does he judge? And when does he judge? Just we see these in Romans 2. Another interesting study you can do from Romans 2 is on the conscience. So we have explained that, um, you know, we see in Romans 2 that the conscience is presented to us as the, the, the law which is uh, built into every person. So that is the conscience. It is a, a function of the human spirit, uh, the conscience. And it's the human spirit which is like programmed with the law of God, so to speak. And so the human spirit is telling the person, you know, this is right, this is wrong, conscience. So it's good to kind of, I mean, just do a little study on that. So it's a built-in judiciary system uh, that is within every person. And one of the things that conscience does is it convicts us. And, um, you know, we, um, we can see one example here in John chapter 8, when, you know, these people came to condemn this woman who was caught in adultery. And Jesus says, you know, uh, whoever is without sin, you throw the first stone. They, in the scriptures say here, they were convicted by their own conscience. So the con their own conscience is telling them, you know, hey, you're not perfect. They, they, you know, this is this is God's standards and so on. So the conscience convicts. That's one of the things the conscience does. It convicts a person, uh, uh, saved or unsaved. But when you have any study in the scriptures about the conscience. So here I make that comment that, you know, uh, we should be careful not to uh, say that the conscience replaces the gospel. I have explained that. Um, and yeah, I also explained about uh, both reason and conscience, uh, two things within every person. Um, so when you do a study on the conscience in scripture, this is just a side, you know, study. 
uh, you know, we can see in scripture, you know, the Bible talks about a good conscience. That means the conscience is functioning properly. Uh, it's fine tuned. Uh, it's serving its God intended purpose to tell a person what's right, what's wrong. But, uh, and so there's conscience without offense. That means uh, it, it hasn't been violated in any way. Um, it's, it's been protected. It's a pure conscience, clear, no, no offense in it. But then we also see other things that Paul talks about. He talks about uh, a weak conscience or a seared conscience or a defiled conscience. And then in Hebrews, it uh, talks about an evil conscience. That means, uh, you know, when, the con when we start out, we started with a good conscience. Uh, I mean, the conscience is in the way, the way God intended to be. It's good. It's without offense. It's pure. But over time, if we are not careful, you know, the conscience could become weak. That means it's no longer having a strong voice in the person to give him a conviction of what's right and what's wrong. It's become a weak conscience. It could be a, a seared conscience, meaning it's uh, now uh, almost dead. You know, And then it could be even a defiled conscience. Now it's thinking wrong. So it's gone from a, you know, a conscience that is pure and, 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 and good to becoming a conscience that is totally opposite, meaning his conscience, the conscience permitting them to do things uh, evil, you know, so it's, it's gone to that state. So uh, uh, what we can, you know, conclude from this little study on the conscience is that it's possible uh, for a conscience to go from the or God's original state to a state that is completely defiled, that it's dead and defiled, meaning it's no longer serving its original good function, but it is, uh, it is uh, actually encouraging the person to do things that are wrong. And it's, it's a defiled conscience. And then, um, yeah, we talked a little bit about circumcision. Uh, the circumcision signs of the, is a sign of the covenant, uh, but what's more important is circumcision of the heart. So that's just a quick walkthrough uh, in the notes that we put. So uh, we'll just take a few moments for questions. Uh, from chapter two, right? Uh, I see um, uh, uh, Kiran's question. What about those who do not hear the gospel and have died? Yeah, so that's where Kiran, we have said that the only thing the Bible does reveal to us is that everyone will be judged according to the gospel. Uh, we don't see an alternate approach, an alternate option in God's judgment. Uh, and so we have no right to introduce something that we come up with. No, we'll just stay with the word. If God is going to do something different, that's completely his choice. But as far as the scriptures are saying, everybody's going to be judged according to the gospel. So we will stay with that. Okay. Any other questions from uh, chapter two? Is it clear? Is chapter two, is Paul's, you know, writing and thinking here? Chapter two, very clear. He's addressing the Jews. He's telling them, you know, he's really showing them that, look, you know, eventually he's going to say all have sinned. You know, and that's what he's building up to. So, uh, so okay. Paul shares on, uh, right. sorry. Yeah, when Paul shares on uh, circumcision, um, is this, like what he shares uh, in Romans in this chapter, is this also the reason why, uh, like um, in Acts 16, I think <clears throat> he encourages Timothy to get circumcised, but later, <clears throat> sorry, um, he um, he um, he does not encourage Titus uh, to uh, to get circumcised. I think the dialogue goes back and forth in other uh, letters mm -hmm. also. No, that he writes, but is this like the core of it uh, or the reason? Um, well, uh, over here, uh, Paul is um, letting them know that what the physical circumcision is really amounting to nothing if they don't keep the law. 
and uh, he's letting them know there's what really is important is the circumcision of the heart right so that's what we're seeing here but yes there is the another very important side to circumcision which uh, which I don't, I, I don't personally I don't see it connected to this what Paul is saying here here he is you know in one sense yes it is connected because it is circumcision but in this case he is telling them that look I mean the, 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 the in this chapter the what he is really driving at is he's telling the Jews your circumcision amounts to nothing the other debate that we see happen in the book of Acts uh, is that uh, it actually happens in Acts 15. So what has happened is uh, at the end of their first missionary journey, Paul, Barnabas, uh, they've brought a lot of Gentiles to the faith. But the Gentiles are believers along with Jewish believers. So they're all together. So now, at that time, especially in the early stages of the church, because there were so many, many Jewish believers, uh, everybody thought, look, you're joining this form of Judaism, which is embracing Jesus of Nazareth, and you need to be circumcised. So the other issue was, do Gentiles need to be circumcised? That is the big issue. Uh, which came on uh, in the church as the church began to expand. So the, the issue is about circumcision, but the issue is, do Gentiles need to be circumcised? Here, the subject is circumcision, but he's addressing Jews who are already circumcised and letting them know that their circumcision really doesn't mean anything if they don't keep the law. Right? So... Right. Yeah, so it, it, it is the same subject, circumcision, but it's coming from two different sides. The debate that took place in the church was, do Gentiles need to be circumcised? So then what happened is, um, uh, in Acts 15, Paul, Barnabas, and other elders, they all gather in Jerusalem. And uh, they discuss this, you know, should... Gentile believers be made to follow the customs of Judaism, including circumcision. Should they be made to follow that? And so they have the discussion. And then uh, at the end of it, you know, James, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem at that time, he stands up and says, men and brethren, you know, and uh, he brings it to a conclusion saying that, look, we will not put any burden on the Gentiles who become believers in Jesus Christ, other than uh, they should not uh, worship idols. Uh, and you know, so that, that was the conclusion. And uh, they should not uh, eat things offered to idols, should not um, drink blood or something. And yeah, and that's you know, these are just that's it. And then they write it down and they send that message out. So then you know that message goes out and to all the churches, and that's what they follow. Uh, so that's you know, a separate issue. Now, in dealing with Timothy, Paul takes a different stand. And so Paul is, uh, I'm going a little off subject here, but uh, uh, Paul is, a uh, you know, following that decision of the church in Jerusalem, uh, Paul is a very strong proponent of, you don't need to keep the law once you become a believer in Jesus. You don't need to follow the customs of Judaism, including circumcision. So that's why he writes the epistle to the Galatians, pr primarily, you know, saying that you don't need to come under the law again as believers. You're free. But then Paul does something very interesting with Timothy. Timothy, because of his blended background, uh, father was Greek, mother was Jew. And because in order to enter into the synagogue and minister in the synagogue, you need to be a Jew uh, to minister there in those, those times. So that means you'd have to be circumcised. You have to be circumcised. So many scholars think that was Paul's motivation in getting Timothy circumcised. Although Timothy's father was Greek, therefore he was not circumcised. 
But Paul gets Timothy circumcised in order to make it possible to go into the synagogue and preach. Uh, so that was his motivation. Uh, not so that, so it almost seemed contradictory because here is a preacher who's telling people, you don't need to be circumcised, you're free. But then he takes one of his team members and gets them circumcised. So it's almost contradictory, you know, from what he's preaching and what he's doing. But the motivation is, hey, in most places we go to, we start our ministry in the synagogues. And if you're going to start ministering in the synagogue, uh, uh, you need to be circumcised. So that's, that's the reason many people think. We don't have that written down, but they think that must have been Paul's motivation. So that's a third issue. Uh, having to do with uh, Timothy. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, you. yeah. But all of this is around uh, circumcision. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Chapter Two? Thomas, Dave, all clear. All right. So let me introduce yeah, Chapter Pastor. Three. Okay. So let me thank you. Let me just introduce Chapter Three, and then we will get into the details, right? So chapter two, he's told the Jew, Jew, you're breaking the law, having the law or having circumcision, no use to you. So then chapter three, you know, remember it's, uh, it's, 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 it's building up, you know, building up. So he says, but of course, you know, he kind of lessens the blow a bit. He said, tells the Jew, you know, but it is important. You, you people are important because uh, you are the people to whom God, I mean, of course, he is included as a Jew. We are the ones to whom God has given the law. It's important. But what I want to, what Paul is, I'm just paraphrasing, right? But what Paul gets at in chapter two is, hey, neither Jew nor Gentile is perfect before God. That's the point. Right? Jew, you are, you are important. So he says, look, I'm not throwing you out completely. No, you are important because God gave you the law. But the point I really want to get at is whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile, you all sinned before God. So by the time he comes through, you know, by the time we go through the first half of chapter three, that is the, you know, that's like the main thing, the main point. We have all sinned. There is no one who is righteous before God. Then, having established that we are all sinned, whether Jew or Gentile, then he says, now he gets into the gospel message. He says, but God has made a way for both Jew and Gentile to be forgiven. And then he starts talking about Jesus Christ the redemption that's in Jesus and how it is freely by grace. And then chapter four, he says, it's only by faith. So we're all sinners. God has provided salvation. But chapter four, it's only by faith we receive. Chapter five, it's because of his grace we receive. So, He's building up like that, okay? So he has established, we've all broken the law. We are all sinners. God has provided forgiveness. We receive by faith. We receive because of grace, okay? He's building that up. So we'll take a quick 10 minute break and we'll get into chapter three uh, as Paul develops this uh, teaching. Have a quick break and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thanks.